Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here and including me as a part of your experience. For a long time now, very much of my mail comes uh, containing a remark, something like this. Please help me see the unfoldment of my right place. Uh, there must be a home or a position or a job or an activity that is right for me or for my husband or for my son or daughter, but I seem unable to find it. Well now, how does one resolve such a problem? In essence, what we are talking about here is place, place. And I don't know of any subject that is more meaningful or any more significant than the recognition of place, of what place is. why it is, and how it is that we finally come to perceive and understand that we are right now in our right place. <laughs> and I'll try as best I can tonight to make that clear. Now you see, I can't tell another how to do anything because there is no other, really. What appears as others, what appears as audience, what appears as friends who've come to listen, and what must appear if, if indeed the perceived can perceive, what must appear as, as Bill Samuel sitting here at Woodsong and <laughs> talking about place, uh, is all included within one awareness that is all-inclusive, outside of which is nothing. Consequently, there cannot be another. But anyway, we need not get into that. We've discussed that, haven't we, time and time again. In any event, while I can't tell another any, how to do anything, when it comes to a matter that I have answered for myself, when it's something that I've lived, when it's something that I have seen straight through to the, to the simplicity that stands behind it, well, I can tell of that experience, I can sing that song, or I can try to tell of that experience, that's all. Well, now, the following is a telling. Simple and clear, I hope, <laughs> and it's going to be meaningful for you. It will be helpful because this story is a story I've told many times and I've seen it go and do its good work many times. Not so long ago, I read uh, some words by a so-called master from India. And the statement was a very beautiful one. He said, God strings his beads harmoniously. Well, now, we know that a bead is a tangible, finite little thing, and we string them together on a string, and when we have finished, we have either a bracelet or a necklace. And the bracelet and the necklace is more than the individual bead. If we take a number of finite beads and string them together and perhaps we can come up with a work of art that's beautiful, harmonious, and it is a whole necklace. Well, in essence, the words we use are like beads. Sometimes I, I can tell my stories 
Well, <laughs> sometimes it seems I do an awful job with them, but this bead stringing about place is a necklace I can do well because I've lived it. Okay, so let's talk about place. Now, if we start at the top, and by starting at the top, what do we mean? We mean with, by starting with the recognition that God is absolutely all, that behind every tangible thing and thought and idea stands an ineffable isness being all there is to that thing or thought or idea. This is starting at the top. So, starting at the top with God is all, probably the most absolute light that I have come to perceive about place, about residence, about home, is that place, or home is where awareness resides within mind, within consciousness, within God. Those three, of course, all being synonymous. Mind and its self-expression, which is awareness. Mind and its self-awareness are one mind. No dualism here. Mind, in order to be mind, has to be aware, doesn't it? And awareness is nothing of itself. There can be no awareness without mind being aware. So mind and its awareness, like the television set and its functioning, are one television set, one mind. So from the absolute standpoint that the place or home is that place where awareness resides within mind and mind in itself awareness one mind therefore place is already assured <laughs> there's no need to worry about it it's happening it's going on right now it's already located well let me let me expand just a bit further so that the intellect of us might be satisfied. As we string these beads, you know, it seems necessary to, to make a statement that is intellectually satisfying in order that the intellect will, can let the heart consider it. And the intellect of us does serve a good purpose, as you know. It isn't to be thrown onto the ash heap of illusion the intellect is the means by which we carry a body from one point to another, the means by which we measure the distance between things, or it is necessary for sequential unfolding. The intellect, therefore, has its domain in tangibility, in its measure of tangibility. But there is a vast universe that is the unconscious universe, the whole universe. Like the alphabet stands behind every tangible letter. And we can say that, well, with all the words, there exists that universe of words, but behind that universe is the intangible universe of the alphabet, which is infinitely greater, and yet at the same time includes all there is to those tangible finite letters. Oh, I don't think I said that so well. <laughs> Let me use another example. Okay, take, we're talking about place now. Place is the subject. Consider an explosion and the sound of the explosion. Well, does the sound have to worry about its place, its residence, its home within the explosion? No, no, no. If explosion is, then sound's place is assured. If explosion exists, the location, the home, the place of sound is automatic. 
And there need be no concern about it, no real concern about it. So in the most absolute sense, therefore, starting top down with God is all home, the place of awareness, he is already assured and there is no real need to worry. Ah, but this isn't practical enough, you see. This is the, the, at this point comes the statement, but this isn't practical enough. You can say there's no need to worry, Bill Samuel, but I still worry. My job has petered out and I'm looking for another one or I'm being evicted from my home for one reason or another, or I've lost my home, or my son can't seem to find a place. So therefore, what you're saying about awareness having already found its place within mine is a lot of ridiculous ivory towerism. It's suited for mystics, it's suited for absolute metaphysicians, it's suited for dreamers, it's suited for people who can afford to go wherever they like, you know, and always have a place. But, but Mr. Samuel comes the argument, don't you see that this attitude that the place is where awareness resides within mind would have one just lethargically sitting on his bull hunkus doing nothing, and doing nothing practical about getting into, into a better climate or a better business atmosphere or a happier, more secure home. Surely, surely, Brother Bill, truth can be more specific than that. All right, yes, I can, I can answer that. Yes, it can be more specific. The statement can be simpler, more simple. Good friends, home is surely one of the most profound ideas that we can encounter. And it can be fully understood by the heart of us, the child heart of us. And when it is, then we know what to do. But more than that, when we understand, we find that we cannot keep from doing, we can't keep from doing whatever is necessary to disclose our rightful place. Now listen softly. Please don't hang hard on these words that you're listening to. Don't listen so laboriously to every word and try to fit it into some sort of a little niche of reason and logic that has to make sense. The light about which I am telling stands behind these words, being these words, and these words themselves are nothing. The light lies in the end feeling in the total, because, because it is the light of home or the light of place which gives rise to these words. <laughs> it, it, home exists already giving rise to these very words you're listening to. So don't hang heavy on the words, but listen for the whole. Well, excuse me, please, while I answer the phone. As I was saying, there's no need to hang hard on the words because it'll be in the end feeling. Okay, and anyway, you know what? The awareness you are speaks these words listens to them, understands them, and it'll be the awareness you are that claps hands in delight. Okay, let's go on. Everyone 
has a place, a right place. And anyone can find it. Now, it's, it's discovery. It's tangible discovery. That is, it's demonstration. Within this arena of people, places, and things really requires so little. Nothing more than childlikeness, trust, acceptance, and anticipation. <laughs> John, put your pencil up for Pete's sake. You should, I'll repeat it. Nothing more than childlikeness, trust, acceptance, and anticipation. And you don't have to remember a single one of those. You know, at that point, uh, voices on the telephone or in the lecture hall will say, you sound like a Baptist preacher, Samuel. Acceptance of what? Be specific. Anticipation of what? We want to know precisely what. Trust of what? Trust. Well, listen, listen. Acceptance that I'm talking about right now, like a child, that one's place is at hand, that it's perfectly present wherever one is. That's the acceptance like a child I'm talking about, that it's right here, right now. A child, I don't think, wonders about its place. Now, I see the quizzical looks. Let me put this in terms very simple and honest, that even the intellect of us will not argue with. But you see the squirrel out there shuffling around, only a few months old, and it's scurrying about, gathering a store for the winter. He's been doing that all day. And yet, the winter that he is storing for is a winter that he knows nothing of consciously, that he knows nothing of intellectually, that he knows nothing of by way of reason and logic that makes good sense, that will stand up to the philosopher's criterion. At least I'm under the impression that that little squirrel's parents have no intellectual process to explain an approaching winter. He has no books to refer to on the matter. <laughs> and something within that little booger just has him going about the business of doing what comes to be done. And that doing, that doing, that effortless doing takes care of his needs for the coming winter. Well, maybe a learned squirrel psychologist <laughs> could tell us that the little critter's subconscious mind contains all the wisdom that it could ever need to know about squirreldom. That is, that, that it has a genetic, a built-in genetic code that has him programmed to go out and, or as we say down here in the South, programmed to go out and find nuts and store them away in a tree. Yeah. Maybe this squirrel psychologist could tell us that uh, that, that wisdom that is programmed in his gene moves automatically from the little squirrel's subconscious into his conscience into his conscious, <laughs> not conscience, into his conscious, whereby that little squirrel just simply acts. Well, to my knowledge, there are no metaphysicians amongst the squirrels uh, with the notion that they can simply sit down and think themselves into a great source of supply, into a storehouse of nuts, without acting on whatever gentle impulse comes from mind.
Every spring here at Woodsong, I watch the wonder of the nest building that goes on all around me. All the birds that build their nests around. And some grand inner wisdom tells these little feathered friends of mine that they're going to need a place, that they're going to need a safe place to put themselves and to put their eggs. And incidentally, they are not yet intellectually aware of eggs. They're not even conscious yet of eggs. They haven't experienced laying an egg yet. These are the, the new birdlings I'm speaking of. Something, and it's something wonderful, is already present within as the awareness or the life, and those terms are synonymous, awareness, life, appearing as a bird. And that something, that ineffable something, knows the complete details of nest building and selecting the location for it and the intricate weaving like the weaver bird does as he makes that nest or as the swallow as it makes its. All of that is built in. Even, even the knowledge of camouflage, how to hide that nest. And you know what? That something, that ineffable something which is already present exactly where the bird is, moves, it would seem, from this divine knowing, this illimitable unconscious, and then it moves through the subliminal, then apparently into the conscious, whereupon the bird just simply acts and builds a beautiful nest. It acts correctly, it acts happily, it acts thoroughly, marvelously, and just like those squirrels there, it acts with great enthusiasm. And very soon, the bird and his little fluffy mate have their place, their place from which to soar and sing, their place to, to come back to after every foray after every sachet, they have their place to feel comfortable in, to chirp and cheep in, to snuggle and rest in, and to enjoy their little birdlings in. But now, listen, I would have you notice that, that before there was ever the tangible place up there in the boughs, the tree, that there was the divine place which preceded it, the divine wisdom that preceded it. The place was and is, that is the divine place, the intangible place, is the fact of being. And in all nature we observe the tangible place birthing itself from out the pre-existing place. This must be what Jesus meant by, in my Father's house are many mansions. You're going to just have to excuse me again while I answer the phone. In just this way, in just this way, there is a most beautiful, complete, fulfilling, comfortable place for each of us. It exists already. It's our holy heritage. Exactly as the bird's intricate place exists before the springtime of time, before the springtime of tangibility with its intellectual action. Well, There's a good reason that people are either ignorant of or question the presence of God, of the overmind, of the unconscious mind, and of the total wisdom it is. 
the intellectual or or conscious aspects of mentation are all humanhood concerns itself with, really, or trusts, which is sort of like putting the intellect in front of the horse and then, and then wondering why we are forever falling into ditches and stumbling against curbstone, smashing against walls, worrying about government, business, family, home. Well, at this point, at this point, the question might be, okay now, Bill, just how does one find, actually find, his tangible place? How does one find the, the intangible place become tangible place? What am I to do? Well, that's the kind of question I like because, because if this truth is anything at all, it is practical and applicable, easily applicable. And I told you earlier what I did. I said that for myself it was a matter of naked childlikeness, of total acceptance, of unquestioning trust and a joyful anticipation. Now, I mean by that naked childlikeness in the acceptance of awareness as the identity I am, a total acceptance of it, an unquestioning trust in the ineffable mind which is being this awareness I am and this awareness in mind, one mind. And then the joyful anticipation of the overminds infesting conscious awareness with what knowledge it needs at the moment. Now, and when I said it before, perhaps I sounded naive. Perhaps it seemed esoteric or impractical, but I bet you it's beginning to make a little sense now. Practical sense, you see. Tangible sense. Now listen, if every living thing on the face of the earth is told of the most intricate things in ample time, like the squirrel there knows of the winter, the birds know how to gather and how to weave and how to build in ample time, and if everything, every living thing on the face of the earth knows of all of this and knows what it needs to know and then finds itself acting to do, actually acting to do what appears necessary, then what the devil is so impractical about my trust or about our trust that mine will do as much for us right here, right now? What is so difficult to accept like a child that the divine place, the holy place, the secret place, the Shekinah is, and it already is, within the whole mind, within the, if you want to say, the subconscious or unconscious, and that it's, and, and that that's what is here and now singing these words. Just as an unbuilt nest exists in, in the unconscious of every birdling that hops <laughs> in the tall meadow grass, so our Shekinah is. It exists now. And I relax with a childlike heart. I acknowledge this and I accept this and I believe it because it's so. Because I've lived it so. I've proven it so. I know it so. Well, all right, so... So I believe it, so I accept it, I acknowledge it, and so forth. But what next? What next? Uh, intellectualism is entitled to a better statement than that, a statement of faith. Well, for myself, I think that I can tell you that I, that anticipation plays a part for me. Uh, now, 
anticipation of what? Well, I know that if uh, the overmind, the divine mind, is being this awareness and includes within itself all facts, all wisdom, all knowledge, then I anticipate that that wisdom will be imparted to the conscious awareness I am in ways that I can apprehend. And for the moment, it serves me to say that I just anticipate the movement of wisdom or the answer, the knowledge of what to do or what not to do, <laughs> to move from mind, the unconscious, perhaps to the subliminal, and then from the subliminal to the conscious. Very often for me it moves simply to the subliminal and it's picked up from that point and I find myself subliminally listening, hearing. This is especially true, as all of you know, during those periods of meditation, during periods of, of being quiet, during that time just before we fall asleep in the evening, or at that time when we first awaken, or when we awaken in the middle of the night, we are so able uh, during those times to hear the subliminal. Because there's not so much to appear to contradict it. The intellect <laughs> is still sleeping, I guess. Well, in any event, it seems that the, the so-called conscious mind of us has to do with practical intellectual matters. That is, the, the conscious mind is primarily the intellectual mind. And, the, and it is concerned with the day-to-day -day well-being of the individual body's experience and the, 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 the scene that is perceived, that it go all right. Well, inasmuch as this so-called conscious mind of us has to do with the practical and with the intellectual, we find that the child heart of us, the child heart of us, which picks up on the subliminal, that seems to be the recipient of the wisdom that comes from the unconscious, the child heart seems to know what to do about whatever is cogent at the moment. And in this manner, we find ourselves simply acting, simply doing, being. Just like the squirrel there, like the bird about the business of tending its young. And we, we find ourselves simply acting without all of the planning of your and the thinking struggling, and the worrying, and the uptightness. In essence, we find ourselves doing what is necessary to find the tangible store for the winter. winter. That is, we find the tangible bow on high where the nest is to be built. And then we find ourselves making the intellectual effort, effortlessly, that secures a tangible place that no storm can dislodge and no, no evil befall. And all that right here in this people, places, and things circus. In, in short, the anticipation of this move from the divine mind to the, its own conscious awareness, which is the functioning of the divine mind, is intuitive living. Well, how do I know this is so? How do I know that it works like this? Well, I can only know for myself by observing this awareness I am and by living the fact of it, and I know it that way. 
I know that by letting the fact of mind live me, that I live intuitively in a manner much more lucid and carefree than ever I was able to do before by trusting and believing like a child that if God, the mind that is all, can care for the least sparrow with a knowledge of the most intricate matters of survival, including, including, uh, <laughs> including all of the little small things that we are seeing this very moment. The beauty of the moment, the blue sky of the moment, those little birds over there fluffing in the pond. Well, if it can include all that, then then most certainly this awareness's view of, of a very confused and terrified and tim intimidated humanity can, can be told that it need not be confused, terrified, or intimidated, but that it can relax and it can rest and it can become childlike trustful even as I've done. I don't know if I said that very well, but, well, it seems that I, having lived intuitively, can look out and tell my, my grander sense of self, appearing as people, that they too can do the same thing and can begin to expect the tangible appearance of of all that one could ever need for confident, joyful living. You know, if it's true for the one standing before the mirror, then it must be true for the image therein. That is, if, if I wrinkle my nose and make a face at myself in the mirror, I can expect that the uh, image in the mirror will do likewise. So, good friends, listen to me. Yes, there is a happy place for each of us. There is a tangible place. Its discovery comes out of childlikeness and trust of the heart, and not, not from all of the laborious mental gymnastics, all of the mind-bending spiritual exercises, not from all of these grand ego feasts that we're reading about, charading as awareness expanding techniques or methods of producing altered states of consciousness. The great new Bible of, of the United States, the National Enquirer, has about 40 presentations each week of books charms, amulets, uh, and so forth that are intended to produce altered states of consciousness or to expand awareness <laughs> and all kinds of metaphysical things to study. Well, doesn't the child of you, the child heart of you shout that truth has got to be easier than all that bunk all of that great flood of instruction about how to get from darkness to light, how to produce instant tranquility, how to manipulate others <laughs> to do this or that, how to have all the women in the world love you or all the men in the world love you and so forth, that, that, that all of that will one day be understood for the pure malarkey and who shot John games that we, that we all play and we play them for good reason and what's the good reason? That their futility, the futility of them discloses the perfect God identity which is our consciousness already right here and now. Now I would like to say that again 
because it is a point so little understood but yet brings such grand light with it. The whole human scene, primarily, and overspreading the beauty and the truth and the wisdom and the joy that is actually being what is called the human scene, but overspreading it is this bunch of malarkey and which is the assumed ego that we live, all of us, for the purpose of knowing the genuine identity beyond intellectualism and knowing we know it. That is, oh, to put it in simpler terms, if I just can, if I can string these beads harmoniously so you can hear it, the heart of you knows what I'm saying is so that it's honest. We live the adult in order that we might rediscover the child of us, but this time know the child of us and know we know. We live our adulthood to its futility that we might rediscover the child, the perfect God identity which is our consciousness, right here, right now, already. Oh, this, this matter of place, this matter of a happy place is just much too simple and tender for a bunch of words like this. You see, we've been told that the, that the truth falls upon the just and the unjust and we must assume by that that it falls on listening ears and non-listening ears it falls upon what appears as stupidity as well as intelligence it falls on all alike i know this sounds terribly dualistic but but it's we've been told that the truth from the least of them to the greatest they shall all see god well now what I'm saying is that this tenderness of identity is so simple that it is as simple as grass being grass. The grass out there doesn't have to study any metaphysical system in order that it receive from the sun and receive from the earth and give to the earth and give to the sun as it does. It just bees grass. This matter of place is as tender and natural as, as a baby breathing. Oh, the problem is, for, or was for me, and that's the only one I can speak of with authority. It was that I, there was a great personal proclivity with myself for intellectualism. And my intellectualism inevitably engendered distrust. That is, I distrusted the, the subliminal urges that said, do this or do that, or don't do this or don't do that. If I couldn't find an intellectual answer that would stand up before the reason and logic that the philosophic world insisted on, then I distrusted it. I had to find a reason for, for everything. And I lived that arrogance, the intellectual arrogance of adulthood, that I might know, <laughs> and know I know, beyond intellectualism. Exactly what childlikeness is, what faith is, what trust is. And all of the struggles, all of the struggles between, between the, that is during the time when intellectualism was preponderant with me, all of those struggles were a fiction 
every bit like the examination of the shadow that the tree might make. The examination of the shadow is, oh, it's real enough, but it doesn't have anything to do with, with what the tree is. It has to do with, with what the tree is not. And so I would say that the struggles between were child life's comprehension of what child life is not, and it was a fiction every bit, and, but it was a purposeful and necessary fiction, else it wouldn't have seemed. It was a good fiction. <laughs> it was a good one. Because don't you see, folks, that all we have done and or not done throughout our lives whatever event has transpired or not transpired for us has been good, not bad, good because it has brought us to this moment of the consciousness of tangibility and to the consciousness of the that which is being tangibility, all in perfect balance. So, all of the anguish that has transpired in our affairs was anguish only to that intellectual, egotistical sense of self. And we need feel no guilt about it. And no effects as a consequence of our poor upbringing or our penury or poverty or our whatever. Though the dream of adulthood may have seemed as scarlet Identity is white now, pure now, innocent and eternally enwrapped within the love that light is, right here, right now. So good friends, we have a place that is a happy Shekinah, a holy of holies, a secret place, right here where we get our mail and right here where we put our shoes and socks on and so we can expect it. There's a happy, tangible place for us where we may rest, where we may be secure. There is a secure shelter for us filled with happiness, books to read, cozy nooks, window sills wide enough to hold sunshine, bouquets of wildflowers, and piles of strange rocks and arrowheads and so forth that <laughs> gathered on the last walk. There is a tangible place from which we may go a-wandering when it's time to wander and to come back to when it's time to come back. All of us have a place where friends may gather and good food simmer on the stove a place where one can dream dreams and sing or rollick to the rhythm of the music of the sphere, a place to dance with abandon, a place to love with tenderness, a place to lie still and gather in thoughts that come from the rest of us, that is, from the overmind of us, a place <laughs> where we can also stop and calculate ways to discourage the woodpeckers from whacking away at the shingles and the, and the chipmunks and from eating up the garden and the squistles from, <laughs> from getting all the bird food. But you listen to me, good friends. If you are child enough right now to listen to this child that is I, well then hear this. Hear this with the heart of you, the child heart of you. Those of us who find the tangible place that I'm speaking of and recognize it for what it is, humble or, or like a castle, are those who intuitively know and trust its already presence as their own 
mind and who expect its tangible appearing, who expect its tangible appearing in all perfection within this experience. And listen, it's infinitely more than we could have ever intellectually calculated it to be. It's always ten times better than all of the planning and calculating that intellectualism could have induced or produced or dreamt about or hoped for. It's always more than that. And what do we do? We acknowledge the intangible place first. We acknowledge that first and and then its confirmation in time and space are certain to appear. And it appears as a wonder. As a wonder. <laughs> as, a, as a singing, laughing, clapping hands wonder. Now, these words are true in faith. As nearly as I can write them as nearly as I can speak to him. I thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>